Hi friends, quick note before the episode starts. We are going to talk for a specific amount of time about sexual assault, not in a very detailed way, but in a way that might trigger some people. So if you would like to skip that section, I have put the time codes in the episode description so that you know where you can um, skip to a nice safe part to listen to. I'm sorry that that happened, but blame Ratatouille for having it in the first place. We also do talk about sexual stuff, I guess, in the podcast, which is not our usual since it's supposedly PG, but like not too explicitly, but I just wanted to let the warning be there. So yeah, check out those time codes in the description if you need to, and I'll let you get to the show. Welcome back to Not Again, the podcast that brings college-level analysis to preschool-level content. I am one of your hosts, Rebecca, and with me today to finish up our talk about Ratatouille is Martin. Hello. And who knows when my regular co-host, Alan, will return. But for those who are new, don't listen to this episode first, okay? Um, This is part three of three of a discussion of Ratatouille, so at the very least, go back two episodes and start with episode one. I know I'm not the boss of you, but it seems like a good idea, right? Like, I'm just speaking to logic here. And, sorry, yes. So, um, what are we doing here? So, we are the podcast that brings college-level analysis to preschool-level content, and we are going to be talking about Ratatouille for the third episode in a row. Spoiler alerts for Ratatouille, obviously. And, um, as I recall, we're going to be starting out in the worst possible place. And so... (laughs) (laughs) Um, I know it doesn't seem like it, but I do have to issue a trigger warning. Um, We are going to very lightly discuss sexual assault. Um, So I don't know how many people have like thought about this, but there is a scene in Ratatouille where there is some questionable stuff Uh (laughs) going on, (laughs) re consent. And so we really have to break the scene down um, to, to set it up a little bit. What we last talked about at the end of episode two of our little series was Linguini was asleep in the restaurant and Remy made the questionable decision to try to wake him up. And in doing so, shenanigans ensued and Colette felt insulted. She slaps Linguini, which actually wakes him up and then yells at him for being a dude and then tries to get away, just run, which is weird because she has a job. Like, I know she's emotional, but she can't just, like, skip out on work. Um, And Linguini runs after her. He says, it's over, little chef. I can't do this anymore, which supposedly, I guess, scares Remy about, like, oh, no, my one chance at cooking might go away. Mm -hmm. And he runs off, and he tries to tell Colette the truth. And he tries to say he has a rat chef on his head, but instead he says he has a tiny chef. And as he's saying that, there is an adult joke where he's like, I have this little, tiny, and Colette's eyes flicker downward (laughs) towards, you know, his crotch level. And I have to admit I laugh at that just because it's such a quick little flicker. Like, what are you trying to tell me, man? And then he says he has a tiny chef who tells him what to do, and he's fumbling. And Remy, meanwhile, is like, don't you dare. This is important. He's like, don't tell her about me, right? He is insistent. Do not tell her about the rat chef. So as Linguini is about to tell her, in order to, um, you know, uh, stop him from (laughs) telling the truth. Colette, at this point, has already tentatively reached for the pepper spray in her bag because Linguini is acting like a maniac, and she's not sure if she's going to need it. And then Remy tugs on the the kiss-the-woman-who-might-not-be-willing hairs on Linguini's head and makes Linguini kiss Colette. And there is a moment where Colette isn't sure she welcomes this. It's played for laughs where she's still kind of like holding that pepper spray. And she's like, do I, don't I spray this man with pepper spray? And she doesn't. So I'm trying to talk about this so delicately. (laughs) Like because she decided that she welcomed the advances by the end of it. It's okay that she was uncertain about it at the beginning, which is not 
great. Yeah, no, it's it's a trope that comes up a lot in uh, in kind of comedy shows and romances and kind of romantic comedies, I guess, um, where this idea that uh, they, you know they're taking a chance on it and the woman isn't expecting it, and the it turns out by that they happen to like it. And that, that there, it's therefore harmless, and then it doesn't really hurt anyone. But it, it's played that way, in such a way that almost as if it's trying to justify the for the initial action. Yeah. Because Colette wasn't prepared for it. I mean, arguably Linguini wasn't either. Neither of them were really knew, really knew this was going to happen. It it was Remy that was responsible ultimately, um, at least at first. And uh, it's hard to tell the point at which uh, the extent to which Linguini is able to kind of control this or push back against it uh, because that's not really clear but what we what we clear what we, what we do see is someone who is feeling threatened by uh, a co-worker justifiably or not and is then like assaulted by that co-worker in a way that from her perspective is quite aggressive mm-hmm. and which she then is, if it, for those first few seconds, is still unsure how she feels about it. And that alone should have been enough to say that this was a bad thing that was done to her. That she happened to like it after the fact doesn't change that. It doesn't justify anything, nor does it justify <laughs> that. Like, I think what the what the movie makers wanted is like, look, Linguini isn't responsible for this either. Remy made him do it. And it's like, okay. They just really wanted a comedy, like interrupt the thought with a kiss scene yeah, which this I mean, is such a trope yeah but mm. imagine the i mean this is too dark for a disney movie but imagine the dissension between them if she hadn't liked it i mean mm-hmm. look at the kind of trouble linguini would have been in just because remy wants to continue being a cook right? so it's, it's also worth noting at this point that as far as colette is concerned linguini is the chef's favorite she doesn't know yet the context for what happened in that office which is why she was mad at him that morning mm-hmm. so you can kind of read maybe into that scene that she is afraid to push back against him because she might lose her job. In a real world and not the cartoon <clears throat> world, yeah, absolutely. This happens all the time. People abuse their power to, you know, ensure the silence of those that they are threatening. This is such an important topic of like consent and what constitutes assault and things like that. And yet I want to move on fairly quickly because I don't want to stay on this downer for so long. It's very difficult. Ultimately, yeah, (laughs) there's not really a lot to say about it. It's important to say it, but it's like, it's not complicated. I mean, this is something, so I think that there is a not insignificant population out there who would say that sexual assault is only through intercourse, like that a kiss could not possibly be assault. Or that it needs to be violent in some way yes. to, be, uh, to, to, be, to be legitimate. And yeah. I just wanted to make the point that if it is unwelcome, it feels violent to the person who's receiving it. Mm-hmm. It certainly does. It definitely feels like a violation. And that's why I was so angry as well, as were many other people, to be fair, um, at the third i think twilight book yeah the third twilight book where jacob forces a kiss on bella because there are people including the author who did not think that there was anything wrong with that because it's just a kiss he just misinterpreted the signs right but in that scene she was trying to fight him off Mm -hmm. and when she tells him that's what she was doing he says oh i thought you were trying to encourage me and like the disgustingness of that scene it's like because, you know, because, or, or it's a woman doing it to a guy and then it's comedic, right? I mean, there's just so many, uh, I don't know what I'm trying to say. Consent is important in all aspects. But it's also <laughs> worth noting, like, consent is not just, <clears throat> there's more to it than just someone saying yes to you. Yes. Um, the, the, you have to consider whether they're feeling coerced in that situation or threatened. Uh, and I think there's certainly ways you could read this scene with Colette in the alley as her feeling in some way coerced. And... Again, because she doesn't have the context for what's happening. She doesn't know that Linguini has no control over his body right now. She doesn't know that uh, he is not, like, using his uh, newfound um, kind of authority with mm-hmm. the chef to, to, to take advantage of her. She doesn't know these things. There's a very dangerous precedent set as well with this idea that the... In this in this context, the the belief that the ends would justify the means, like as long as she mm-hmm. likes it by the time I'm done, yeah, it's okay that maybe she wasn't sure about it in the beginning. Well, because what that tells you is that what you did in the first place was the right thing to do. Exactly. And it just happened by chance to be something she was okay with. Mm-hmm. But you didn't know that going in, and you don't know that if you do that to someone else, that they'll feel the same way. To to kind of end on a 
better note, I guess, about this is I have been reading a lot of romance novels lately, and I can't really talk extensively about them because this is jokingly a PG podcast. Like, obviously, we talk <laughs> about, like, as the last seven or so minutes will indicate, you know, we talked about some pretty heavy stuff. But I discovered an author I rather like. I mean, as, as with anything that I label historical romance, please understand that it's actually historical in square, in square quotes, historical in scare quotes romance. Like, I mean, I've never read a historical romance where I'm like, huh, this feels 100% accurate. <laughs> like, I can totally tell this would have happened such and such hundreds of years ago. They are definitely wearing hats here. <laughs> As Heather Sinclair, my best friend, will tell you, there was one time I was attempting to write a historical novel when I was a teen, and I don't know why I thought I could, considering my knowledge of history is mm, not good. And at one point I demanded of her, because she's smarter than me in every way, did they wear hats? Because I knew at, at some level that like there was a time in history when people always wore hats, but didn't really grasp when, why, or how. And so that has <laughs> followed me um, well out of high school. But um, no, so uh, the author's name is... I'm going to double check this actually so that I'm not... Thankfully, I have Libby. Libby, come support my podcast so that I can support you. I love you, Libby. <laughs> not, not a woman named Libby, mind you. It's Although any, for any Libbies out there who want to support the podcast, yeah. please feel, feel free. Yeah, also, you know, if your name is Libby, um, Courtney. Okay, I went with Christina. See, I got the C right. Okay, so her name is Courtney Milan. Um, I follow her on Twitter. I like her writing, regardless of whether his, her, quote, history is accurate or not. It never is, let's face it. Like, the, the thrill of a historical romance is that, like, there's this dude who's been raised to believe that women are possessions, but then he realizes maybe they aren't, maybe they're people. And it's like, Ooh, I'm titillated by this Shocking. idea, but also he's good <laughs> at romantic things. So she wrote, um, a, I think a five book series, which starts with, it's called the brother sinister series. Um, not because, not because it's like, Ooh, they're bad boys. Although I suppose they are in the context of history. I mean, I don't know how much bad boys can be when they're wearing like cravats and stuff, but like, you know, it's like, <laughs> Oh yes. Yeah. Me and my ascot, we're going to smoke a cigarette. There was a time uh, when that was the uniform of the cad. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, but, uh, there, she wrote a novella about kind of a prequel novella about one of the character's parents um, that really, I think, deals well. Like, it's still it's still going to contain the trigger warning of, like, you know, talks about sexual assault, although, of course, it doesn't go into detail. But it deals well with the concept of assault with coercion as opposed to. So so the young woman <laughs> in question doesn't realize that she has been uh, assaulted because she was coerced into saying yes by a superior, by somebody who was, um, mm -hmm. like she was a serving woman or something and he yeah. was a count or duke or something. Right. Someone who has a lot of authority. Over yes. Her. Yeah. And so she, she meets a different man who is actually nice to her and, he, and she doesn't realize like when he asks like, you know, were you assaulted? She says no. Because she doesn't realize that she has been. And eventually she does realize it. And of course, and it's a romance novel, but I think that they, that Courtney Milan handles, I think I think she handles it really well, and it's not a lot of romance novels will just be like, oh, well, you just need to find the right man to replace the bad memory with a good one, and like that's not how it works. Like she acknowledges that this woman is traumatized, as does her love interest, and they go through it together, and they and they work very carefully through her trauma. And I thought it was a good novella and a good series if you're into it. Um, it is rated pornographic. Um, <laughs> in at certain, I mean, it's like how do very I very explicit. It's it's not erotica, but it is explicit. Yeah. I think is what I would say. And so, but I think that what I like about these stories is that they are stories. Like the, she really compels me with the characters. They feel fleshed out. Hey oh, um, and uh, <laughs> and you know, more ways than one. In more ways than one. I'm getting too raunchy for this podcast, but um, <laughs> I would I would recommend it for those who are romance readers and especially historical romance readers. This the Brother Sinister series. Um, my favorite is the suffragette scandal, but you you might like any of the others. I read them all. I enjoyed them all, and I think that I think that it's really important to talk about how forced consent is not consent, basically. Yeah. And now, fifteen minutes into our Ratatouille podcast episode, we can move on. Um, at this point, you will have seen the time code um, in the description saying that you can jump to this point, and you're right, you can. We're done talking about that. So, um, moving on to lighter topics. Moving on to lighter topics. 
probably not actually. We're going to end up talking about like I don't know um, the man and capitalism and communism. Oh, yeah. and I don't know. At what least else. that's a little but, more abstract. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but yeah, so so they kiss, and I guess they're in love now. We are going to come back to this idea of Remy being incredibly angry and terrified about uh, the possibility of Linguini um, telling the truth um, in a later scene. So put a pin in that and remember that we were talking about it. But before we go there, we uh, have a cut to the ostensible antagonist. I guess that's really Skinner, but the faux antagonist or the secondary antagonist, Anton Ego. We're going to actually talk about something positive. He's a vampire, right? So um, all the all the <laughs> Not literally, between... it should be said, well, as far as we know. He's a figurative vampire, but yeah. that's just it. It's like he feeds on other people's success. And so even though he's a food critic, he's very tall and gaunt, well, not tall, but like gaunt. And he looks undernourished, and it's because, like, the implication is his his real sustenance comes from other people's pain and misery. He has this wonderful line where he says that he doesn't like food. He loves it. Yeah. And if he does not love the food, he doesn't swallow. Yeah. Implying that he actually eats very little. Yes. <laughs> and I also would say that he... Um, I like that scene because it's very subtle, but as soon as he says, if I don't love it, I don't swallow, Linguini swallows nervously, almost like comp compelled to do it by Ego's words. Like it's a very good dynamic establishment, but we're in Ego's office, I guess, which you see from overhead is shaped like a coffin. His typewriter has a skull face. Um, <laughs> he has a Renfield, who he is does. Dracula's <laughs> little assistant dude, although Yo. his name is... Ambrister or something like that. <laughs> yes, Ambrister. Yeah. yeah. But and you pointed out that he has framed reviews yep. <laughs> around a giant portrait of himself. So there's a giant painting of him sitting right on the wall in front of where he works. And several framed copies of his own reviews. <laughs> yeah, so so his his own um ego, I guess. I, there's a reason why they named him ego. Um and 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 arrogance is just like right there on display for you, as well as the fact that he is a figurative vampire um and a Dracula character, and he even has like kind of fang like canine teeth he also has these really broad shoulders yeah. that kind of suggest like a cloak or wings or something like that yeah, yeah visually it's kind of cool so you can he's a very good character design. i mean as as we have heard in past episodes i'm not always delighted with pixar's character design cough cough edna mode <laughs> but yeah. in this case they put some good thought into it and i liked it a lot so it's worth saying and um, i think uh, on the subject of anton ego that he is one of many examples of brad bird Really just taking shots at critics in general. Oh, yeah. You said um, that he has a uh, problem with critics. Yeah, he does. He, he doesn't respond well to, to, to critics who don't like his films. And there's a lot of uh, kind of... There are a lot of film critics out there for whom Pixar and Disney movies are not really something they enjoy. So that happens a lot. So the, up, the, up, the, the, kind of the, the effect of that is that Brad Bird sometimes has characters in his movies who are him just saying... Haha, <laughs> critics are stupid. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they shouldn't be criticizing things. They should be loving them. And all they need is a quick flashback to their childhood. <laughs> but we'll get there. Um, but yeah. Um, so yeah, um, so we've been introduced to Ego. His little Renfield person tells him that Gusto's is popular, which instigates, I, I would say probably act three of the movie is just like Ego enters and mm -hmm. threatens everything. Yep. So uh, we, we set the scene for Ego to burst in later and, you know, set up the final act of the movie and meanwhile we are in the uh, uh, linguini and colette in love montage i guess of the movie where uh you know they're checking each other out in the kitchen they're taking wild moped rides throughout the city <laughs> um, like you do <laughs> yeah which when you're in love you often moped together um and there's another scene that I really dislike is when uh, Remy's trying to cook and Colette tries to hand Linguini a different ingredient. I think I already talked about this, but whatever, where she says, no, 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 use this. It's better. And Remy insists on trying to prevent Linguini from taking the jar of ingredient, not like even using it, just taking it. And this is where we talked about how like it's clear that Linguini struggles to like fight the 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 control that Remy has over his body because Linguini is like trying to reach for the jar and Remy's pulling back and Linguini has to use one arm to help push the other arm towards what like he has no control over his body and the thing is Remy just take the darn jar 
And then like when Colette turns back around, have Link Lady put it down somewhere. Like there is no harm in just taking it. It's not like she was gonna watch and be like, now put it in. Yeah. I'm watching you. I think the um I think you're supposed to read that scene not so much as him not wanting to use the ingredient as like him lashing out in jealousy. Like he's a little bit jealous that Linguini's spending more time with with uh, with Colette and with paying more attention to what Colette's doing and less time worried about the cooking and Remy, what Remy wants. And I think that was certainly how I read that scene. It's like he, he's acting irrationally because he's jealous. Maybe that, maybe he's threatened by her. Yeah. Like he doesn't like the idea of another cook trying to step in on his turf or something like that. Mm. Either way, he doesn't like her. And this is really quickly where they take the wild moped ride and... Um, Linguini, for some reason, is still wearing his chef's hat with the rat underneath yeah, it. And so weird. <laughs> they drive off and the hat falls off his head with Remy in it. Remy runs to, you know, out of the road nearly gets run over by a car. And this is where the diners in an outdoor area of a restaurant see him and start, like, either throwing or dropping wine bottles at him. I brought that up in episode one, I think. So that happens. And he says he's reminded of how it's, how fragile it all is, which is weird because of the scene where... Well, we'll get there, but we're the scene where Link Weenie finds out he's the owner of the restaurant and Remy wants him to reveal that he has a rat on his head. Like, you know how fragile it is, and yet you seem willing to... Anyway, we'll get there, we'll get there. I know I say that a lot. It's worth noting in film time, the gap of time between Remy desperately trying to hate his own, his own existence to him being upset that he's not being revealed to the world. Yeah. It's very short. Very short indeed. We will speculate about why he suddenly feels like he wants it revealed, but I'm, I'm, spoiler alert, I won't be happy with any of our speculation. Anyway, so to get there, this is a scene, so I had a, an eccentric theater teacher for my theater elective in high school, and she did say one thing that really resonated with me as a writing thing as well as an acting thing. Um, she said that in acting, the pinch should always justify the ouch. Meaning if somebody walks up to uh, somebody else and pinches them and the person who received the pinch starts screaming bloody murder, it's not very believable, right? So if someone gets shot, they can scream bloody murder. But if they get pinched, they might go, hey, don't do that. <laughs> and this and this I bring up as an example, um, the Disney movie, The Princess and the Frog, which I know you don't like, but I do. So, you know, get over it. Okay. I'm just, I'm not, it's not that I don't like it. I'm just... It's kind of boring oh, right. to me. <laughs> I, I'm, a Di- I'm a Disney adult. I, I fully admit it. I love Disney movies. I think one of the things that happened with Princess and the Frog was just like considering how low my expectations were for that movie. <laughs> I saw it and I was like, really? This is it, fine. <laughs> I still remember the trailer being like, everyone talks about the princess kissing the frog, but nobody talks about what happened next. And I'm like, no, they do. It's the yeah, end of yeah, the story. Yeah, they go, mm-hmm. the princess kissed the frog and he turned into a prince and they got married. That's li- They literally that, that, do that's talk the about story, what happens yeah. next. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so, <laughs> so, so there's a quick note. Yeah. Um, it just is kind of a, a funny thing about the princess and the frog. Um, Heather and I have tried to watch it multiple times, and Heather has fallen asleep about halfway through every single time. Yeah. <laughs> and she doesn't do that constantly. That's not normal for her. So she's just she's just like usually we try to watch it at night. And she's like, oh, this is so boring, and just <laughs> falls asleep partway through. <laughs> yeah, it's not really a your cup of tea, I don't think. But anyway, so in that movie, for those who've seen it, they uh, um, I, this isn't a spoiler because it's in the trailer. The protagonists get turned into frogs and they end up in a swamp and they need to get to someone to change them back to humans. And they encounter along the way animal friends because they're in a Disney movie. Mm -hmm. And one of the animal (laughs) friends is an alligator named Lewis. And when the alligator asks, you know, what's going on, Prince Naveen frog says, brace yourself, my scaly friend. We are not frogs. We are humans. And Lewis bursts into the most uproarious, roll on the floor, can't breathe, side-splitting laughter you've ever encountered in any movie ever. And I hate that scene. Because what he said was not that funny. Not even to an animal who's never encountered the idea of a human being turned into a frog. I could see some laughter. And the reason they did that too was to have the sudden transition from him laughing uproariously to taking a deep breath and going, are you serious? Like, I get that. It's for comedy effect. But I don't think that that metaphorical pinch of we are humans justified the metaphorical ouch of mm-hmm. laughing that lo- or loud yeah. and long and hard. I think, so, I think it's worth saying as someone who also studied theater and studied drama, um, and I'm familiar with this idea. Yeah. And one of the things that uh, kind of I learned, I've learned about that is that sometimes the pinch isn't obvious. Like, sometimes the extent of it isn't obvious. And usually, sometimes what it's trying to do is tell you something about the character. Like, as you say in, in the in the metaphoric, metaphorical example here, if someone pinches someone and they start screaming bloody murder, 
maybe it's not so much that the pinch was painful, but that person's just very sensitive. Yes. Maybe it tells you something about them rather than the action. Yeah. And there's different, and that, that opens it up to different ways of reading it. And it opens it up to the possibility of this might just be a heightened world where you're meant to read that as more painful than it really is. Or then it tells you something about the environment. Or maybe it is, as you say, it is just uh, not communicating the idea effectively. And I think it really you've got to use your judgment to some extent whether and how effective you think a particular approach is. And as you said, I think the example of from The Princess and the Frog is quite a good one because... To me, that doesn't make sense in that context. And it's not just that it doesn't make physical sense. It's like it doesn't make tonal sense. It doesn't, it doesn't really add anything sense, to like, the scene. It doesn't make the joke funnier. We it, know that yeah. Lewis is the character who will ham things up. And yet, do I really want to be sitting there saying, like, this cartoon alligator is really putting it on here, like laying it on thick it on comes purpose. Off as ve- <laughs> it, it, it kind of accidentally implies that he's exaggerating for, like, like for, for effect, for attention yeah. or something. For attention, yeah. yes. And so, um, and so, this brings us back to Ratatouille. Um, I also believe that in writing, this works in that um, every piece of dialogue that gets a response mm-hmm. is technically a pinch, yep. and everything, every response has to make sense in in response to whatever the dialogue is, yeah, based on what you know about the characters and what you know about how the world works, right? Yeah. And just logistics, I suppose, as well. Now, I don't know what changes this script went through. And so this strikes me as something where a scene or a line was cut or altered. Mm -hmm. I don't know. This just happens to me when I'm writing sometimes where I will accidentally change half a sentence, but leave the first half the same as it was. You (laughs) know what I mean? I've done that before. (laughs) Yeah. You know, and so it struck me as something like that, but here's what happens. Um, Emil, Remy's brother, and his chumos, his mates, come come by. Chumos. And, yes. <laughs> his friends come by, his rat friends come by and, and ask for food, as they've been doing. And Remy goes to the walk-in, discovers it's locked, and decides to go into the chef's office in order to find the key for the walk-in. You know, this is, I think we brought up this scene before because this is a conversation they have about stealing since that's where they push home the, they keep pushing home the idea of like, don't be a thief or whatever. But Mm -hmm. after that, Remy finds the key and underneath the key is the document that Skinner was looking at. So the letter from Linguini's mom and Gusto's will. This always bothered me. Even when I liked the movie, had no reservations about it whatsoever. No pun intended restaurant reservations or something i don't know (laughs) um remy asks hey he says hey it's your will and then he asks why would linguini be filed with your will because he finds gusto's will and then a clipping of an article about linguini Mm -hmm. and he asks why would these two things be filed together gusto's response is this used to be my office that's not an answer to the question that does not explain why Linguini would be filed with his will. My thought is that the, the line used to be, why would your will be here? That makes a lot more sense. And then yeah. he would say, this used to be my office. Yeah. And but, that explains a lot, right? But I think at some point they needed to change it. Mm-hmm. And they, well, they, they changed the scene to add the clipping, the of, clipping of Linguini, of Linguini yes. in there, yeah. And it doesn't make sense anymore. <clears throat> it doesn't matter whose office it is. It's still really weird to see Linguini supposedly a stranger filed with Gusto's will, right? And so I hate that scene. <laughs> I don't like it at all. The pinch does not justify the ouch. Um, and so, yeah. Anyway, so there's a comedic scene where Remy grabs the documents. Skinner catches him. There's a chase scene. Um, Skinner accidentally drives a scooter down a staircase and falls off of it, not wearing a helmet, and bounces several feet and is fine, oh, even yeah. though he's just bouncing along the concrete. So good for him, because he apparently is immortal. Um, and eventually, um, Remy escapes. And what's interesting is Skinner walks defeated back to what he thinks is his office only to discover uh colette and linguini there with the documents kicking him out and saying you know we own the restaurant or whatever and this is the only time that skinner associates the rat with linguini if he was already doing that he would have been like oh no now the rat is going to go to linguini because we were talking last episode about how for some reason he wanted to catch linguini with the rat Mm -hmm. but the justification for why he wanted to was never clear especially since this scene implies that he had no idea there was any particular connection between linguini and this rat yeah right um, he didn't even have any way of knowing it was the same rat. Yeah. Like, he, he had literally never seen 
Remy in person at this point. He just seen his silhouette or like very brief hints of Right, him. he saw him the first yeah. time he was in the kitchen and then the rest of the time was just I think hint Yeah, because the initial sightings, they make sense as, oh no, a rat. Mm-hmm. Like exactly. reacting to there being a rat in the kitchen. Yeah. Then it continues to become, he's obsessed with this idea there's some relationship between Linguini and the rat, which makes no sense. Honestly, the way he reacts to seeing yeah. Remy in his office, it's almost like he thought the rat was trying to sabotage him, not Linguini. He's like, I knew it, that rat. It's here to steal my documents. It's like, I, think you, I think you're maybe supposed to read it as, <laughs> he's got this important paper that mm-hmm. I need, and I need to get that back. But like, he, I don't know, his desperation Yeah, and then he it finds out very that strange. Linguini got the documents. And Linguini's not worried at all that Skinner would associate the rat stealing the documents with him now having it. But Linguini's not exactly the brightest bulb, so... No. <laughs> um, you know, whatever. So this leads us up to the thing I kept saying we'd get to. We're finally here. Um, they discover that... Linguini owns Gusto's. They light all of the frozen foods on fire, including the horrible stereotype uh, stand-up cardboards of Gusto in various... I mean, it's fair. So I'm like, okay, at least that's gone now. Yay. <laughs> you do know that there's more to shutting down a business than just burning the merchandise you have in your office, though, No, right? that's not true at all. <laughs> um, as soon as you burn the merchandise, I mean, that's why uh, every like toy owner, like toy company, has one of each toy locked away in a vault so that not all of them can be burned. Like, I get that it's symbolic. I understand that it's it's re- not literally representing what they're doing. But, but it, it does raise some questions. Like, for example, if, as is implied before, that Skinner started these frozen food lines as a way to keep the business profitable, what's going to happen to that money? Because you still have a full kitchen and restaurant yeah. to staff. Now, as it turns out, that doesn't remain a problem for very long <laughs> no. but um we can say that linguini he doesn't know that brings new attention yeah. to the restaurant anyway so they they light, they light that on fire linguini's the new owner you know um and he's doing a press conference because mm. i guess you know people are really interested in this restaurant whatever gusto was famous it makes sense and remy is furious that linguini refuses to tell all of these reporters that he has no say in his own success. It was all Rat Chef hanging out under his hat. And this is just what you said. Like two scenes ago, he 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 caused Linguini to throw himself at Colette just to keep him from revealing this truth. To one person. To one person. <laughs> and now suddenly he wants Linguini to reveal it to all. Now and again, this is this has a live action Aladdin problem of like he he's gone from being quite humble and happy with his lot in life to being like big headed and I want more in the space <clears throat> of a second. Like there is no gradual build up really to him like needing more from life than just working behind the scenes mm-hmm. or getting fully like arrogant and you know like nothing can touch me. He's just like like just a scene ago he went I was reminded how fragile it all was and now he's like hey tell all these reporters you got a rat on your head like the only justification I can come up with for it that we don't again I have to guess at this because we get no evidence of it from the film is that Remy thinks that now Linguini's the owner of the restaurant he won't fire himself for having a rat on his head so why not just tell everybody about it but even that doesn't make sense because Remy is fully aware that rats aren't allowed in kitchens Mm -hmm. and so it's not about like Linguini won't fire me it's about once people realize there's a rat there they're going to be like close this restaurant rats killed half of Europe a long time ago it's also (laughs) worth noting that um, it's been impressed on on us multiple times in the film that the problem with people's reactions to rats is not just that they don't like them, it's that they will try to kill them. Yes. We've seen that we've had several lengthy scenes now of people attempting to kill Remy on sight. Yes. And it is, it, 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 there's higher things at stake. And again, I understand wanting to have that turn in here. You have a moment where the, the, the character who has labored behind the scenes for a long, long time and has actually put all the work in to earn this success is not getting recognized for it. And that to me makes sense as a character beat. Like he gets frustrated that he's being ignored when it's his work that's making a place famous. Mm-hmm. And then uh, just when he thinks he's about to get the, the attention he wants, someone else gets it instead. I think it's Colette in this scene. Yes, um, he says... Uh, uh, and again, that, that, that might tie into the read that we're supposed to read him as being kind of jealous, jealous of, of Colette. Yeah, I can see um, that. But it, it's what we call unearned, meaning that the sudden shift, the shift in character has not been demonstrated in a way that feels natural. Right. We it, saw one we scene have to, where we have to, Yeah, we have to infer and assume a lot know. of things yeah. that we're not shown or told about. Yeah. We're just kind of 
in a way that doesn't make sense for the film. I mean, actually, what we yeah. are shown and told is that Remy is incredibly conscious of how precarious his position is. Mm-hmm. Every time Gusto's like, "Don't you know? Don't wreck your chances. You know, you could get fired." He's like, "Don't worry. Like, I know how. Like, I know what I'm doing. Like, I know how." Um, important it is for Linguini to keep his job because I know that I could lose my job if he does. You know, like he has been conscious of this the whole time and right up to making Linguini kiss Colette. And then suddenly it's like, this seems like a great time to reveal all. Nothing has changed. No, nothing materially has changed. Sure, Linguini won't fire himself, but the public's opinion of rats is the same as ever. And in fact, as we know, um, as soon as the public becomes aware there's a rat in the kitchen, that kitchen is shut down. Yeah, we'll learn that later. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that happens. Um, we're, we're getting kind of along here, and I kept telling you that it was going to be a short episode. Why do I always lie to you and myself like this? Um, we so all do this. We'll it's move how we get on. Life. Yeah. Why is Edgar Allan Poe a health inspector? Did he just it does like, kind of look a bit like him, doesn't yeah. he? All right, moving on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we've already touched on this. So oh, uh, one quick note about yeah. that, just a quick aside. Um, it's very funny that a health inspector has an appoint- has a, has a, a, one, a one-man waiting. department yeah. who has a six, is it three-month waiting list. Three months, yeah. That's not a thing. If, if someone reports rats in a the kitchen, they get investigated yes, quickly. Yes, that's right. I forgot to say that, yeah. He's like, I know that there's rats in Gusto's. And he's like, oh, really? Well, I'll check it out in three months. It's like, no. If By that time, calls, you've got several dead patrons. <laughs> there, there's a difference between I'd like to schedule my regular health inspection and I have noticed a an infestation of pests in the kitchen Besides of the restaurant. Besides which, you don't schedule your own health inspection. No. The health inspector does that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, I don't know. Edgar Allan Poe just doesn't care, I guess. He he is so depressed over uh, Annabelle Lee. I forget her name now. Anna, uh, uh, Lenore, Annabelle uh, gets a couple of different Yeah, sure. Cousins, um, that he doesn't care about. A couple uh, of different cousins. Yes, yeah, so a couple of different cousins of his that he doesn't really care about rats in the kitchen. So, we've already touched on this, so I'm going to say it very quickly. Uh, Linguini and Remy have a big blowout fight over the fact that Remy nearly messed up the press conference. Remy decides to get back at him by bringing his whole colony into the kitchen to steal food, at which point his dad pokes his head in the kitchen and goes, an inside job, huh? And he's delighted by this, even though the whole conflict at the beginning of the movie was that his father hated the idea of Remy going anywhere near the kitchen. He was like, don't go near the kitchen or the humans. It's dangerous. All the way over to, hey, I like this idea, an inside job in this restaurant kitchen it's like what what no (laughs) it's another example of the same issue i think we talked about in the brave episode we mentioned a couple times here where it feels almost like there's two different films being kind of operating at the same time and kind of clashing into each other yes like there's two separate scripts that were written for this and they were kind of combined and never real not all the scenes are really papered over properly right yeah um okay so then we are we also talked about how it's too cartoony um i think that was I mean, like, I want our listeners to listen to episodes one and two. So in one of the previous episodes, we talked about the tonal inconsistencies of the scene where Linguini confronts Remy and then eventually gets hit in the neck by grapes that are spewed out of Remy's brother. And What's that character's name again? Emil, the fat Emil, stereotype. That's the one, yeah. And how we don't like the tone, we don't like the believability. So go back and listen to the first two episodes in this miniseries. You'll, you'll hear us talk about that. But um, Linguini discovers that Remy was trying to steal food. The kind of, I guess like coming to the head this idea of thieving and it coming back to bite him and stuff like that since the movie really really wants us to understand that you should not steal under any circumstances because of course Linguini yells you're stealing food oh the rat colony did not fall into a sink full of dishwater by the way no uh, before crawling from the sewers into all of this food in fact you can see them hiding themselves amongst the grapes the the produce that yep. you know all of it the cheese and so uh skinner was actually right if a health inspector had seen that uh the restaurant would have been shut down at the very least linguini now has to throw out everything in that walk-in because they brought sewer right into it you can't tell me mm. that they cleaned up later they will well at this point this they is don't the problem they have to yeah this is the like. problem you were pointing out is because they keep bringing up those occasional scenes when they do clean up it really draws attention to the fact that when they don't and so uh later they will they will go through the dishwasher hilariously because like that would just kill them um but like this time they didn't and so all of that food is just covered in rat then we get to the final climactic scene of serving ego even though remy isn't around um 
Skinner is dressed, quote, in disguise, which is a hat, sunglasses, and trench coat, but he's still in the restaurant. And I just love the idea of him being like, oh, I will have whatever he is having. And then just like the, the waiter, waiter being like, sure thing, Mr. Skinner. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, just, like I've worked with you for like seven years. I, I know what you look and sound like, but you know, I'm not going to question it. Like, bye. There's no one else in Paris that looks like you. <laughs> yeah. Somehow. <laughs> uh, speaking of character design, I don't like. Um, but again, listen to previous episodes. So I just like that idea of just like, oh, I'm in disguise and then just him being like, oh, okay, Mr. Skinner, whatever you say. <laughs> Sorry about my horrible French accent earlier, by the way. I think I did more like Russian than anything else. Um, <laughs> so uh, Skinner is in the restaurant in disguise. Uh, he has captured Remy and put him in a rat trap in his trunk, at which point he has kind of like a, I guess, big reveal moment about who he is and the lesson he's supposed to learn, which I'm not... so. Brad Garrett's like, ah, so you've given up. And he's like, yeah, I'm in a cage. I've given up. I, I'm hopeless. And then he yells like, I don't need you to tell who, me who I am. I don't, need, I don't need you. I know who I am. And, and Brad Garrett Gusto is like, I, you, you never needed me to tell you who you are, Remy. And it's like, is that it? Is that the lesson? I found a lesson. You, you've always known who you are be be true to yourself it's always the lesson in a disney movie just be yourself and that's fine <laughs> but be confident in that i guess yeah, be confident feel good in about who it. you are yeah, just feel good about it you can you can like your family and your career <laughs> it doesn't have to be one or the other <laughs> unlike what hallmark will teach you you can actually have a career and a family <laughs> that you are not diametrically opposed um or mutually exclusive or whatever you want to say. So, yeah, so they have that moment. And then, um, and I guess at this point I wrote the movie is trying to make too many points. And I, mm. I think, I don't exactly know where in the movie I wrote that, but I think it's true. Yeah. Right. I mean, they I have, agree. they have don't steal. They have be true to yourself. They have, you know, family, family is important and all that because they definitely have the we're, we're not cooks, but we are family message coming from the dad. So there's like this whole family thing going on there as well. And, and I think you can make a case that these are all things that connect to each other. Um, because the idea, for example, that uh, they don't have to be cooks to be effective in a kitchen it kind of ties in with the larger idea that um you know anybody can cook which is the the, the quote from oh Gusteau, yeah that's another lesson that, um, is like the can, idea these things know, all connect to don't each let other, your so humble I, roots yeah, yeah. like uh, and then uh, also don't be afraid to die for it yeah <laughs> it, it, it is remy like bravely bursts into the restaurant willing to die for his dream to be a cook and it's like i think it is a little undercut um, by the idea as well though that the only way that you can do this that you can be a part of a cooking kind of environment even from humble origins is if you do exactly what you're told by a genius <laughs> yes. I mean, it's just there's so many you're right that there's connections but there's there's still so many threads and they don't tie up very neatly no. in fact it isn't until remy is willing to die for his dream to be a cook that his dad respects him he's like wow my son nearly took a cleaver to the face for that i guess he is serious about this i guess i will give him my unconditional love and acceptance all right <laughs> let's go cook for him you know and then he's like we're not cooks but we're family and then they drown in a dishwasher and remy's like oops i did not test that before i put my entire colony in there turns out that hot boiling soapy water will just kill my family oops oh no fine they're fine it's a cartoon and i also um i wrote because at this point uh linguini stops them from stabbing the rat with all of their kitchen knives, which again, probably you shouldn't, right? Um, you're using those to prepare food for people. And um, they they all walk out on him after he reveals that he had a rat helping him cook. And I'm like, wouldn't one person be like, yeah, sure, whatever. Like I wouldn't think the, the dishwasher I, or one of the waiters be like, fine. I think what we're seeing here though <laughs> is they don't believe him. They think that he's kind of lost it. Okay. And they want to get out before the whole thing collapses. I think that's how we're supposed to read that. Sure. Because what we have here is a restaurant that's already kind of teetering on the edge that recently made a comeback, but is still a bit precarious because, and it's about to like essentially it's throw down with its most ship. dangerous like critic. What an appropriate analogy. Yeah. The rat's abandoning a seeking ship. I mean, kind of, yeah. yeah. So. And what we there have is that it, it's essentially having a kind of showdown with the, uh, the, 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 the most like, dangerous critic in the city yeah. who could ruin them completely yeah and he's got a rat on his head and they all think well we're done here i guess time to move on and find another job yeah well <laughs> I, I find this hilarious because i don't remember typing this but like colette is the last to leave and she like lifts up her hand and tries to slap him and i wrote she's gonna slap him because he thinks a rat can cook <laughs> it's, like, it's such a wonderful reason to slap somebody. Like, how dare you think a rat can cook? Hata! <laughs> <laughs> I think we're also supposed to see in that that um, 
it, she kind of connects that to what he was saying in the alleyway before and that it wasn't just awkward fumbling. Like he really was a bit sort of, he was being serious in his mind and he, yeah. he maybe wasn't as uh, together as sure. she thought Bring he was. Logic yeah. to this. I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to be as fair as I can. Uh, yeah. I pre- <laughs> no, I appreciate you playing devil's advocate. Cause I, as much as I love these movies, I'm also very unforgiving. <laughs> so anyway, they all walk out on him. Linguini says, thanks for trying. It's the belly of the whale moment. Then his dad's like, here we are rats to cook, blah, blah, blah. They go dishwasher themselves. Then they start serving food. Linguini discovers that his joy and ability, to, his joy with and his ability to roller skate is all he ever needed from life. <laughs> so he becomes a roller skating waiter in a fancy restaurant. They serve the soup, I think, to Ego, and he lifts a single eyebrow in question as he tastes it. Um, so he's not entirely sold on the restaurant, but he's not ready to condemn them either. And then they serve Ratatouille to Skinner and Ego. It's and the name of the film. <laughs> yes, it's, wait, yeah. No, I'm just kidding. Of course, it, yeah, it's the name of the film. And Ego eats it and has a rather hilarious flashback, uh, at which point Heather Sinclair had to explain to me that for some reason French children find vegetable stew to be a delicious comfort food. Backwards country that it is. Oh, okay, so it's worth saying it's not just a vegetable stew. Uh-huh. There's more to it than that. Is there that. chocolate in it? No, there's not chocolate in it. Okay, so <laughs> there you go. Um, and he has this flashback. It's hilarious. He, he symbolically drops his pen and he loves it. And then Skinner's like, no, this is impossible. And he tastes it. And he has, I have to say, some expressions and actions that imply <laughs> that this food has done a lot to satisfy him. And I can't see it any other way. He just, he has a buildup, a climax. It's all there. I, this this episode has been very sexual. I'll put a warning at the beginning. There's something very funny about that scene because I think it gave a lot of people who haven't seen it before a wrong impression of what Ratatouille looks like. Yes. Because what they give, what they actually serve to Ego is a very unusual take on it. It's a very, uh, what I guess what you would call elevated Ratatouille because yes. it's meant to be uh, a simple, what they would call maybe a little derisively a peasant dish. Yeah, the I think idea is it's made with, calls it that. Yeah, it's made with like uh, ingredients that you would like have grown in a far local farm that you would be able to make at home fairly easily. I think that that's that's why they have the yeah. flashback scene. Yeah. It serves two purposes because it also shows what Ratatouille looks like. Yeah. Right? He has this big bowl of chunky vegetables. It looks nothing like what he's been served. So not only does it show like why he has this like nostalgic connection to it, but it gives us an idea of what a typical Ratatouille yeah. would look like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and of course, me, I hate vegetables, <laughs> but the the version that Remy makes does look delicious. And I think yeah. a lot of like YouTubers have made it like to be like, this is how you make the Ratatouille from Ratatouille. And I would probably eat it. I probably would. It, it would looks pr- delicious. It's probably very but nice. But I wouldn't yeah. use it as a comfort food. I'm sorry. I don't care how much butter you put in it. It's not a chocolate <laughs> mousse. Okay. So anyway, right. So uh, in, in this in this big climactic scene, the rats do um, attack and tie up both Skinner and the health inspector, mm-hmm. um, and. Um, it is played for laughs, and obviously I can see why it's funny from the context of a w- person watching a cartoon. But like two men emerge from the kitchen that day with entirely new ideas about rats and possibly some trauma. Not necessarily positive ones either. Yeah. <laughs> and Colette sees this happening too and just kind of looks away like, if I didn't see it, it didn't happen. <laughs> Not my problem. And like, do they never need anything for the walk-in that whole night? <laughs> They're locked I think they just walk around They them, walk yeah. around them. They're like, excuse me, Mr. Skinner, like kneeing you him aside. Me that, like, you passed me that apple over yeah. there. <laughs> Um, we'll let you go later. We promise. This isn't a serial killer thing. <laughs> like, you know, just, I mean, the rats like run over the health inspector's car in this horror movie moment as his little smart oh, car yeah. won't start. That'd be just, terrifying. Yeah, <laughs> so funny. Anyway, so then they have a great night. Ego leaves after finding out the truth of what's going on. He doesn't slap Linguini for thinking a rat can cook. So good for him. And then Remy's narration says... The only thing predictable about life is how unpredictable it is. And then it cuts to the restaurant being closed down for having a rat infestation. Which is entirely predictable. Which is an incredibly predictable thing. (laughs) Two people were assaulted and kidnapped by rats. They witnessed rats filling a restaurant kitchen and then did the thing that is legally supposed to happen when you find rats in a restaurant kitchen, which is they closed it down. It's worth noting, if the idea was that they would change people's minds about rats... There's kind of two main issues with that. First of all, they make no attempt to make this public. <laughs> yeah. And secondly, that they did commit some pretty serious crimes. Yeah. What are they going to do, though? Arrest the rats? See, it was very clever to have the rats do all the tying up and kidnapping. Because <laughs> so the they don't have rat handcuffs. Have to be like, they, don't have, they, they have no way of bringing the justice Although, system to the rats. from the justice system's perspective, how could the rats possibly have done that? <laughs> exactly. 
So, but like Linguini can just be like, what? I never touched them. <laughs> you have nothing. No and suddenly Linguini's like stroking his mustache and no like evidence, copper. <laughs> steepling his fingers and he's evil and he was the villain all along. So yeah, it's completely predictable that they would close the restaurant <laughs> down. It's like, what? I thought they would change everyone's minds about rats and be allowed to stay open forever. So it is a completely predictable re- reaction. And then they open their own restaurant and we can tell that Ego is happy now because he's wearing a beret. Mm-hmm. And smiling. And smiling. And like, there's a little window for for Remy to like look out at Ego in the restaurant and like communicate with him. But like, I feel like that's not what one. It's not overly a good idea because like other people could look in the window because he has a little staircase to go look out into the restaurant. And two, um, that staircase renders that door unusable. Like the whole. Is it not attached to the? Back of the door. Maybe though? it is. I, I, so I will, it swings with it. I'll give them the benefit of the doubt that it's attached to the back of the door because the idea of a restaurant is you have to have an indoor and an outdoor so that nobody ever crashes into each other because there's a lot of people going in and out of the kitchen the whole yeah. time. So if he's rendered one of those doors useless just so that he can feed his little rat ego <laughs> and his human ego, um, <laughs> you know, it's just like <laughs> anyway. So he has a restaurant and. It's super popular, and it's called La Ratatouille because that's the name of the movie. And Ratatouille, I don't know if you know this, the first three letters are R-A-T, which spells rat. (gasps) And the main character is a rat. Yep. I figured that out all on my own. (laughs) Um, And I guess we've come to the conclusion that we should never steal. We should work hard for what we want. We should be ourselves. We should be true to ourselves. We should trust our family. Family ties are close and bond us. And uh, what other less? I mean, so many things all wrapped up here. And health inspectors still exist. And so, like, what happens when the next one comes by and sees Remy in the kitchen? Because he is the head chef. And do they have other employees? Or is it literally Remy, Colette, and Linguini? Because, like, it takes a lot of people to run a kitchen. And Remy is just run free, like... Do they just be like part of the hiring processes? Like, and hypothetically, if our head chef was a rat, how would you feel about that? <laughs> I just, I don't know. We have Colette as sous chef, Remy as head chef, Linguini as the waiter, and they will never get a day off in their lives because <laughs> they are just running this restaurant. I kind of, I think, apart from the very, very ending, which I think is a little silly, um, the like the last scene in the new restaurant, I, I'm never really fond of that. Overall, I like the ending of this film. I think the denouement works pretty well. Oh, denouement. I have such like... It's a French word, you know. Yeah, it's very appropriate. <laughs> I have kind of mixed feelings about it, but I think as a film, I think it works quite well in those last scenes. The reason I have mixed feelings about it, though, is because there's some things I really, really like. Like, there's a point where Ego gives this uh, speech towards the end after he's eaten the ratatouille, and he's you're, it, you're meant to understand it as him writing his review. Yes. So he decides to take a different tack from what he normally does when he writes these reviews and said that the... One the, the 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 time when a critic can really do something good is in the discovery and defense of the new. Right. And I think that's a really good way to end that because that does to me hit at the parts of the film that work the best. Right. Because it's about try it's about being open minded to new ways of looking at things and understanding that other perspectives can be really valuable. Which I is think that's, yet yeah. another lesson. <laughs> I think of all the lessons in the film, that's the one that rings the most true to me. Yeah, and I think both because I think it's the most correct, and because it's the one that the film chooses to focus on. Well, I think it's yeah, I think it's the one that comes through the clearest yeah. as well, um, and the least inconsistent. And don't but, be afraid to defend something new. Don't be also, afraid to be open minded. But it bothers me because I think the one thing I don't like about it, I think I think that undercuts it, is that they have to frame it in terms of nostalgia. Yeah. Because the thing that changes Eagle's mind. It's a dish that reminds them of his childhood. Yes. That's not new. <laughs> he That's stacked not... it up, though, and he put a little leaf on top. But it, it, the whole point when he eats it is it brings back a specific memory. A sprig. Yeah. So, I, I, Sorry, the, really, it's it important to, to me it, that yeah. I remembered the word yeah. sprig. Because <laughs> <laughs> there's two elements taken into account for that dish. Both the dish is very effective and very evocative. It produces very powerful feelings, which is great for a dish. You want that. But it also reminds him, and it also does this in a specific way for him because it reminds him of his childhood from a long time ago when his mother made him ratatouille. Mm-hmm. And it, it, I think I understood that as him saying, this, this is just like that. And I have very fond memories of that time, which is why I like it. That's not discovery in defense of the new. That is assimilation. Mm-hmm. You have a person who is a new kind of person doing the thing that's already acceptable to you. Yeah. And that's why you approve. Remy isn't making a new dish. 
He's just making a dish in a new way. He's just a new type of He's chef. He's just making it in a new shape. Yep. Like he, <laughs> he, he's making a classic dish which you have a personal emotional connection to and using that to sell the idea of him to you. That's gonna, not defense of the new. If we're going to bring this, cat, this uh, not category, what allegory of like the rats are immigrants or whatever mm -hmm. to its conclusion, his defense of the new isn't the food, it's who's making the food. Yeah. And he's like, sometimes... You have to let foreigners into the kitchen. They can make French food just as good as real French people. And it's like, that's not great. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's what we call assimilationism. Yes. The idea that outsiders are more successful and should try to become a part of what we think of as the normal culture. Right. His only defense and that's the, the only new... way that they'd be able to function in our society. And that is what ultimately comes through here. And I don't know if that's intentional or not, but I think it does kind of fit in with some of the other things we pointed out like the mm. example that um it's wrong to steal under any circumstances even if you're desperate even if you're an outsider who has no other options you should never steal you should work hard for what you get mm -hmm. and that ties to the same idea because what you're essentially saying is that someone who's an outsider who is in some ways an, a, a, a metaphorically an immigrant in this in this case should not act like they are mm -hmm. they should act as though they're one of you and follow the law just like they should act as though they're one of you and cook the food you like. Yes, you're right. The only defense of the new that Ego is doing is of, is of the chef, mm -hmm. but not necessarily the chef's practices or cooking. Because I feel like the, that speech is good. I like yes, that speech. I do. I, I think it's In really isolation, well it's yeah. a great speech. Yeah. I think in the context of the film, it doesn't work as well as it should. And apparently it was just Brad Bird enjoying creating a critic who is who is humbled. Yeah. <laughs> you know, who, who has to who eat his so words. Who is so amazed by, I don't Again, know, the no Iron Giant or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he just loves the Iron Giant. Um, okay, well, it's been an hour. I definitely told you this would be 30 minutes, so sorry about that. Uh, it turns out we had a lot to say. No, you might um, be able to trim some fat in the edit. <laughs> yeah, I'll just cut out all of you. Okay, yeah, that's <laughs> That makes no. sense. Uh, no, you say more intelligent things than I do, honestly. So if anyone's going to get cut, it's me. But thank you so much for listening. Thank you for existing. And thank you for helping us to maintain our marbles for just one more week. I'm going to be honest. I don't know if we're going to come at you with a new episode next week. It depends if I can track Alan down or get maybe like Adele to guest with me. But I will try mm -hmm. to come up with a new episode soon-ish soon um, in the coming weeks. Thank you for sticking by us as I go to glass school. Thank you to Alan for composing the Not Again theme that you hear at the beginning and ending of this podcast. Thank you to Martin for, you know, <laughs> being Ooh, a guest so often. I really, really love having you here. Uh, speaking of which, you can find me on Twitter at Bexgoose. That's B-E-X-G-O-O-S. The pinned tweet on my profile has pretty much all you need to know about both me and this show. But you can also find this podcast, Not Again, at Not Again Pod on Twitter. Uh, Martin, where can people find you? They can find me on Twitter at uh, Is This Martin. That's at I S T H I S M E R T Y N. Um, I have a couple, but I mentioned this the last couple of episodes. I have a couple of podcasts which are temporarily on break, but one of them is uh, the Haven, which will, which is going to start its second season. I'm going to start recording on that soon, and that will be a narrative fiction podcast, essentially a, a radio drama based on the first season, which was a actual play D and D podcast, um, which is currently up. There's ten episodes available of that. You can find that on basically all good, uh, all good podcast apps. And some not good. Yeah, and some terrible ones. Yeah, like, uh, I don't know, <laughs> iTunes. Yeah, so The Haven, for a quick reference, is uh, you can find us on Patreon at patreon.com slash The Haven. That's T-H-E-H-A-V-E-N. Um, we also have a Discord. We have, and on Spotify, you can find us by just looking up The Haven. You can also look out for um, The Family Business, which is going to be my uh, episode by episode Supernatural podcast, where we go through each episode with a couple of friends, one who's never seen it before, one who has, but not for a long time, and myself, who's un uh, unfortunately <laughs> something of a fan. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then not, not my proudest moment. And yeah, so uh, until next time, not necessarily next week, but in, until next time, I've been Rebecca. My guest was... Martin. Thank you, Martin. <laughs> and uh, my usual co-host is Alan. Uh, hopefully he's doing okay uh, with my abandonment. And I will see you next time with somebody. Who knows? <laughs> we'll, we'll, somebody will be with me. Play it by ear, see yep. who it is. Bye, friends. Bye. Bye-bye.